Hello everyone, welcome back to the weekly video where I make poor choices with my life. We are continuing to read Starfish today. We left off on page 94, which means I think we're going to page 118. I have one more video left in, in this month as part of these weekly ones. I'm just going to go ahead and record these back to back and they're both going to be Starfish and then uh, in the hopes that we can just kind of get through this quickly because now I'm starting to get bored with Starfish, but, not, but I, like, I don't like leaving video series unfinished because I did that a lot with my Let's Play uh, channel and it's just frustrating for anyone who's watching to like not have the full thing and I don't like and I've just in general tried to become a person that doesn't leave a shit ton of unfinished projects lying around. So uh, we're committed and we're gonna get through this so let's go ahead and start. Choosing sides. Sometimes I fear Splitsville for my parents too. I try to picture what life would be like, spending part of my week with dad, the other part with mom, half of my stuff at one house, the rest at another, constantly packing and unpacking, never feeling settled, no one place to call home. But what I feel relieved too, no more hearing them fighting because of me would be nice. Of course, if I had to choose which parent to live with, I know it'd be dad, not because I loved him more but because I'm not sure mom loves me at all. And I actually don't have a problem with that one so much. Like the, I, I really kind of feel like the, the verse part of this has just been kind of thrown out the window. So much of this reads like traditional prose, but when it comes to characterizing how a child witnessing a deterioration of their parents' marriage and kind of thinking about who she likes more of her parents and the complex feelings around that, that wasn't bad. Where hate comes from. Will there ever be world peace when families can't even agree on what to have for dinner? Dad wants barbecue. Mom wants the latest, greatest, trendy restaurant. Anais wants all things not American. Liam wants pizza. It doesn't matter what I want, wherever we go. I don't even bother to look at the menu. Mom always decides what I get. We go to Mom's Choice, and while we wait for our food, a little boy from the next table comes over. Dad plays up his accent. Well, howdy there, little fella. The boy looks at me, and then at his dad, who nods and grins. The boy faces me again. You're fat. He runs toward his dad, stops, comes back, and adds, Oh. And save some food for the rest of us, would ya? The little boy gets a high five from his dad, and everyone at their table dies laughing. In a flash, my dad's at their table. The little boy's dad stands up. Dad towers over the guy. Now I can imagine what dad looked like growing up on the panhandle ranch and wrangling bucking bills. A hush falls over the restaurant. You owe my daughter an apology. I'm sorry she's fat? The boy's dad chuckles. The manager comes over, steps between them. Let's all remain calm. Mom stands up. Stop, Philip. Let's go. We've been humiliated enough. We? We are out of here. Mom tugs on Dad's arms as she tells us kids to go to the car. Like I said, Mom always decides what I get. Okay, so, one, this whole interaction at the restaurant is just so unbelievable. Like, there's not a shred of credibility here. The boy coming up saying he's fat, getting a high five from his own father. His father, his father encouraging him to harass someone else at a restaurant. Like, it's it's just so fucking weird like no this wouldn't i'm so i don't believe this would happen i do not believe this would happen and i'm glad that dad sticks up uh for her to a certain extent though i understand the mom like trying to pull him away to help defuse the situation because your father getting in a knockdown drag out fight in a restaurant uh could cause other problems but and this, like, mom always decides what I get, meaning that she doesn't get the apology, she doesn't get anything, so they just leave. Which I, I'm, I kind of understand her perspective, too. My biggest issue, though, is that this whole circumstance, like, the, the, 
boy's dad even responding with, I'm sorry, she's fat. Like, it's just so cartoonish. In this whole situation is just cartoonish, pretty much. A comet's tail. I've been keeping a secret. Viv texts. You're scaring me. Are you okay? See for yourself. See for yourself. She sends me a link to a video. A mascot that looks like a snowball, but with a blue and orange flame tail, dances onto a football field. The crowd yells, go, Comet, go. The band drums pound, pum, 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 pum. Comet wags the tail at the opposing team, whoosh, 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 whoosh. The home team erupts in cheers. Comet dances until the football flame. <laughs> Comet dances until the football players run onto the field. Its arms morph into snakes and hips making figure eights. I recognize those moves. Viv is the mascot. Then Viv and I video chat, and it's good to hear my friend's voice. I've never been cheered on by my classmates before. Being chosen as the mascot is a huge honor. I'm so proud of you. So happy for you. I mean it, but I'm also envious. Viv found a cool way to be okay with her size. How do I do that? To me, that seems as impossible as finding a unicorn. So after the cartoonish interaction, this one actually isn't super terrible. Viv found her groove. There's a sense of happiness for the friend, but then also a little bit of jealousy. Very typical for this age group. I don't have a problem with it. Liam's Wish. In English class, my teacher says that even the worst villain has a bit of a good side. She obviously hasn't met my brother. I find an extra notebook in my backpack that mom must have thought was mine when she was straightening up. I flip it open. It's Liam's writing journal. Having a fat sister stinks. We can't do stuff like go to amusement parks because she can't fit on the rides. And when we go out, people stare at all of us, not just her. Sometimes it ticks me off and I want to punch people. Mostly, I just wish I didn't have to be seen with her. Liam is so full of hate for me. I can't even think of him as my brother anymore. DNA doesn't make you family. Love does. Actions do. Outside, in a rage, I tear page after page out of his journal. Toss them into the hungry mouth of the chimney and light a fire. As flames devour his words and smoke swirls up my nose, I realize the anger I feel now isn't just about Liam's horrible, heartbreaking words in the journal. It's from all the words I've ever wanted to say back to him. Words that have been smoldering inside me. It's time to let them go. They don't seem to bother him one bit, but they are hurting me. Oh, I'm sorry. I have issues with this one. It's his private journal. He can write what he wants. If that's his feelings, like, I can understand as um, her older brother, like, he gets frustrated that they can't, he can't do things with his family because of her weight. Like, I think that that's, I mean, well, we have to remember Liam is in high school um, and he has been shown more than once to be the designated, like, driver for her when he needs to pick her up. He's clearly embarrassed by her weight, given that high school has a lot to do with image. I can also understand that. Uh, not saying that, like, all of this is right, but he wrote these, and I understand he hasn't been a very good brother just in general. Like, I, I get all of that, but at the core, these words that he's written were in a private journal that she technically shouldn't have been reading. Like, I don't, I don't even get that this is, I mean, I can see how she can interpret it as full of hate for her. Like, I get that. And perhaps he is because it's harder to have, like, those distinction of emotions between hating the situation and hating the person themselves. Those two will blend together when you're younger. Like, I get that. But to destroy his journal and set the, the stuff on fire, it's like you, you didn't really have a place to do that. I'm sorry you were hurt, but one, you really shouldn't have been reading those words anyway. It was his journal. And two, that was his property that you had no right to destroy. Perhaps this is, like, you almost want to go... Didn't your mother do something like this? Didn't your mother take stuff from you and destroy it? 
I thought that was something that happened. Maybe I'm wrong. But regardless, I don't think that it's right. Worse than pee on carpet. Eliana Elizabeth Montgomery Hofstein, what do you think you're doing? Mom screams as I use the garden hose to extinguish the last flames. Your dad's office, she points as if I don't know the way. Now, she follows me. Philip, do you know what your daughter did? Her voice calls ahead, warning him that we're about to storm the door. Once in dad's office, mom points to the couch. Sit. My dog and I instantly obey. Gigi looks up at me with her bulging pug eyes like, this is worse than pee on the new white carpet bed, isn't it? I nod. The secret of surviving childhood so far has been knowing when to keep my mouth shut, but I am not a child anymore. I have feelings. I have thoughts. I have the right to express them both. Mom fills Dad in and starts in on me again. You know the rules. No starting fires alone. Ever, ever, ever. What did you burn? Dad asks. Just some nasty writing. I didn't want anyone else to read. I don't lie. So tearing it into pieces and tossing it into the trash wasn't an option? Mom throws her hands up in the air. Nope, not when you're always going through my trash. I can't believe I just said these words out loud. And it's so worth it to see the shocked look on her face. You should hear all the words I want to say to you, Mom. I may be grounded, but I'm lighter than a balloon as I float to my room. To a certain extent, Ellie is like only 11 here. I understand Mom being upset that she started a fire, even if it was cathartic for her. When she, not only did she start a fire, but she destroyed her brother's property. But if like the mother was really upset at her starting the fire when she's not supposed to, like, I, I don't know. She, I, I, not having like a good idea of exactly where this is taking place exactly because she got the garden hose. It sounded like it was outside. They said it was something about chimney. Like, I don't, I'm not having a good visual of where this is happening exactly, but I could see how mom would be upset about that. But the whole, I'm not a child anymore, I think that works well with Ellie's perspective because she is getting to that age where she doesn't want to be seen as a kid, so I understand that, but she is very much a child. And this is this pushback isn't bad. Like I don't, I, I think this is okay with a kind of coming of age story that we have here. Shabbat, in the Lone Star State, Friday nights in the fall are all about football, but not at our house. Although we could use a few referees, especially after this week, when it's been one scrimmage after another. We gather in the dining room. I dread when we greet each other with hugs and Shabbat Shalom. I prefer cuddling with a porcupine over hugging Liam. I look forward to the blessing though. Even though mom's a Christian, she participates. My parents place their hands on my head and pray over me. I always focus on mom's voice. May God show you favor and be gracious to you. May God show you kindness and grant you peace. Favor, kindness, peace. Yes, I'd like that from mom for a change. Whaling season. Mrs. Boardman, my English teacher, wants us to read all kinds of books, not just our favorite genres or authors. Reading should be like dining at a buffet, she says. You have a lot to choose from. Fiction, poetry, graphic novels, and more. There are books galore. Eat them all up. After we read, we're supposed to write about the books in our journals. A teacher who talks about books, food, and writing? Trifecta. I know which book I'm reading, I tell Mrs. Boardman after class. Song for a Whale. It's about a whale whose song can't be heard by those around him. I know what it's like not to be heard. Unfortunately, Marissa overhears me. It figures you'd want to read about a big old whale. Her eyes shoot a harpoon and she claps for herself five times. She claps whenever she completes a task. Always five short, rapid claps. Her habit must be quite awkward in the bathroom. Wheels are unique, beautiful, and powerful, Mrs. Boardman says. 
If you bothered to learn more about them, you'd know that. I give five quick claps. Which is like, I don't know, this is really, the, the, it's, there's a very like, severe dichotomy of like good and bad. Good are those that support Ellie, bad are those that do pretty much anything that she doesn't like, which isn't wrong, given that this is the perspective of an 11 year old. I don't know, like, that's not, but it's presented as fact, I guess. And I, again, it's so hard because as middle grade, you want to connect with the students. It's more about that emotional connection with the, with the student reading it. So the sense of how I feel is right and other people are wrong isn't outside of an, uh, what the average reader for this would be given their emotional maturity level. As an adult reading it, it's irritating. And is like you can see, while you see Ellie's perspective, you also see the things that she doesn't consider because she's 11. And I don't necessarily have a problem with her throwing some shade internally at Marissa. There's just the the teacher kind of scolding her in a is scolding Marissa in a way that was a little catty feels off as someone who te like even if a student really pisses me off I'm not gonna do that because I don't want to feed into animosity between students like that would show that I'm taking a side that would show that I'm treating students unfair like that it's that sort of thing you know comforter. Mrs. Boardman asked me to stay after class. Your last assignment. She hands me back the poem I wrote. It's wonderful. I'd love to hear you read it. Memories wrap around me when I'm wrapped up in my quilt. Memories of watching Boba She weave squares cut from old clothes into a celebration of Hofstein ancestry. Each tells a tale. Baby pajamas, lace and satin wedding gown, striped cotton jacket with a gold star, my hands glide over the faded fabric, worn velvety smooth over the years. Years of hiding under it after school and then when muffling my cries after Boba she moved away. Memories warm me more than the fabric as I snuggle beneath it, feeling Boba she's love living on as the quilt holding and comforting me. Mrs. Boardman seeing your snaps. Your first reading, your Officially a poet. Break away. School break. Two words that spark joy. In the hearts of students everywhere. Family trip. Two words that spark fights. In the car, the plane, the hotel, everywhere. Dad booked a fall foliage tour. Two flights and countless hours just to see dying leaves in New Hampshire and Vermont. I'll never understand grown-ups. And then he throws in a surprise to tick an item off his bucket list. We're going to Niagara Falls too, a long road trip. To top it off, there's no pool. Even if there were, I'd just as soon tie bloody fish around my waist and dive into the ocean of sharks than swim with strangers. So far, like the past couple ones, nothing really worth commenting on. Say cheese. The universe should warn you when something horrible is about to happen, give you a chance to take a deep breath before your breath gets taken away. While my family fights over what to do next, I watch the water thunder over Horseshoe Falls in New York. Someone taps me on the shoulder, a girl speaking a language I've never heard points to her camera and me. I nod and reach for the camera to take a picture of her with her friends. But faster than glowing water, the giggling group surrounds me as the girl takes our picture, and I'm in the center of it. I imagine the social media post. Girls encounter Fatzilla in America. It goes viral. I'm a global joke. What do I do? I think about what Doc said. I have the right to stand up for myself, to defend myself. I force myself to walk over to them and use my hands to say, I'm willing to take their picture. I snap a group photo and, then one of the falls before, turning my back to them for just a second, just long enough, then I give the camera back. When the girls walk away, I toss the camera's memory card over the falls. Oh, oh, God. 
you don't know what other camera but that wasn't stick i don't like this i don't like this at all what the fuck is this team no you have no idea what other pictures were on that memory card that wasn't sticking up for yourself that was being a dickhead that and destruction of pro like we, now she destroyed property twice when someone did something she didn't like oh dear god oh my god that's that why did no one ever teach her that you don't have the right to destroy someone else's property because you don't like something that they wrote or something that they did like that's i'm sorry that just brought it to light a couple of instances of students like taking something because they didn't like what someone wrote and like ripping a picture or ripping it like that i'm like was it encouraged by this book that's what i want to know because they see it as them standing up for themselves oh man i didn't like that hard to talk about for the first time i'm really glad i have an appointment with doc as soon as i sit down i show her the latest ugly word i wrote on the ever-growing list of hurtful things people say to me monster noun a human grotesquely deviating from the normal shape one who inspires horror and disgust me i create niagara falls in texas when doc asks me to tell her what happened and before i can get one word out the tears flow i cry so hard so long dad hears me then i hear dad pacing in the waiting room a few times his cowboy boots stop right in front of the door and the handle starts to turn and stops and turns away until finally I open the door and let him in and he sits and holds me like I'm a little girl and rocks me until I'm all cried out. Okay, but are we going to address the destruction of property? Like, I'm, I, I feel for her, but at the same time, like... Her getting her feelings hurt on vacation was not a reason to take that person's memory card and throw it into the falls. It just, oh. Sometimes you just need more time. Our session is over, but Doc says we need to talk. So Dad goes back to the waiting room, never knowing what made me so upset. I don't know if I'll ever tell him. I don't want to ruin his good memory of Niagara Falls. I feel so stupid not figuring out what they were up to. And I feel so guilty for what I did. I stole something. You did more than steal it, girl. I've never done that before. I destroyed their vacation photos. You feel guilty because you're a good person who made a bad decision to snatch the card rather than defend yourself. Doc hands me a piece of stationery and a pen. Write that girl a letter and confront her. Oh... I don't like this. I don't like you feel guilty because you're a good person. I don't like that. Nar I, I don't like the, the narrative of good and bad in this situation. Like you're a, you stole the card and destroyed it, but you feel bad because you're a good person. So write a letter and confront the, the girl whose memory card you took through, uh, through into the falls. And don't get me wrong. Given that, it was language that she didn't understand. The girls were likely taking pictures with her as, look at this American, this kind of fat American. Like, I, I understand the implication there. And I do like that she says, you, you made a bad decision to snatch the card rather than defend yourself. So she's not equating the snatching the card with defending herself. I like that. That being said, you said you made a bad decision to snatch the card. She made a bad decision to destroy someone else's property rather than defend herself. Let's look at it for what it is. Even at this age, she needs to understand that what she did, yes, she destroyed the vacation photos. She cost someone money because depending on the memory card, it could have been a bit more expensive. We don't know what country they're from or how easily they had access to it, given that she didn't know the language that they, like, there's so much more that goes into it. And instead, the doctor's telling her to confront the girl in a letter. And it, I just, I don't like it. Dear stranger, dear a girl who tapped me on the shoulder, what made you think it was okay to take a photo of me without my permission just because I don't look like you? What if someone took photos of you showing everyone what makes you different? 
What part of you would you want to hide? Do you think it's funny to make another person feel like less of a human? P.S. You must feel kind of bad about yourself if you feel good when you hurt someone else. P.P.S. Sorry I stole the memory card. That was wrong of me, no matter what you did. At least she acknowledges, but I, I don't like that it's just like, I stole the memory card. You did more than steal it because the, the concept of stealing it, at the very least, the theoretically, even though it would never actually happen, you could in some roundabout way possibly track it down and get it back like it would never happen and i understand that but there's just something different to me between stealing the memory card and destroying it like she did like there's it's a subtle but distinct difference to me that i feel should be acknowledged also what made you think it was okay to take a picture of me without my permission she thought she did get your permission you guys were communicating through gestures she pointed the camera and pointed at you. You nodded. She thought you gave her the okay to take your picture. She did ask your permission. There's, I don't like this whole series of events right here. Taking a stand. It's been quite a week at school, so I should have known something was coming. On Friday, when I go to my locker, before heading to the library, I find a picture taped to it. It's my head photoshopped on a whale's body. I tear it down, ball it up, and throw it at Marissa. Hard. Wham. I'd aimed for her head, but hit her heart. Well, where her heart would be. If she had one. She just snickers and walks away. And then, as if that weren't enough, enemy number three decides to start his old lunchtime routine of slamming his back against the hallway wall, as if I'm taking up all the room. Get back, make room, there she blows. But instead of lowering my head in shame, I hold my head up high and lock eyes with enemy number three until I'm standing in front of him. You think you're funny, I tell him, but you're just plain old mean. Maybe I can't stop you, but I can at least make you look me in the eye every time you do it, and I will from now on. As I walk away, I realize I've been starfishing starting to claim my right to take up space in this place. I don't like that defending herself is equated with taking up space, but okay. Making a difference. Doc wouldn't approve of me throwing stuff at Marissa. Oops. But I think she'd give me a giant thumbs up for how I confronted enemy number three. I'm not the best at math, but even I know that one out of two isn't bad. Then I noticed Mrs. Boardman in the hallway, too. Come with me to my classroom for a minute, Ellie, she says. Mrs. Boardman motions for me to have a seat. I flop down at the desk, and we both stare at my shaking hands. Confrontations aren't easy, she says. I'm sorry some students make school hard for you. I know it takes a lot of strength to face them. I think you're brave. You're a great writer and have a way with words. I hope you'll keep using your voice to share your point of view, to show others what it's like to walk in your shoes, and maybe they'll feel empowered to stand up to their bullies. Her words make me feel better. Today I faced my bullies, and maybe I can show other kids that it can be done. The And then everyone clapped. Like, there's just, like, it's the most unrealistic series of situations that I barely even understand like I I can barely even verbalize anything it's just so stupid it was so that was so poorly written I hate so much about it that I feel like I need time to process I, I kind of gave you guys my initial reactions with how unbelievable I felt everything was oh man that was that was the I think the most rage inducing segment we've ex read so far for me let me know what you thought about that. I'm really curious to hear everyone's thought on this segment of the book. Because so much of it was bad to me. But I'm going to leave it here. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.